Belt and Road kind of ticks a lot of people off, right? Because China comes in. I mean, think of Sri Lanka and they build this port and they're like, oh, you're in debt. Actually, I want that port for 99 years. Sounds a lot like Hong Kong, by the way, uh, which China is still burning about. <laughs> Welcome to Shield of the Republic, a podcast sponsored by The Bulwark and the Miller Center of Public Affairs at the University of Virginia. I'm Eric Edelman, counselor at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, a Bulwark contributor and a non-resident fellow at the Miller Center. And I'm joined by my comrade in arms and all things strategery, Elliot Cohen, the Robert E. Osgood Chair of Strategy at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and the Arlie Burke Chair in Strategy at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Elliot, how are you? I'm doing very well. Um, this may be the subject of a separate podcast, but I've decided I wanted to reread some old classics. And I just got this one, uh, Solzhenitsyn's First Circle, which is probably his, his best novel, uh, although some might dispute that. And what's interesting is um, this edition is the edition which includes about a, it's about a fifth longer than the um, edition I remember reading originally because he suppressed some parts of it in order to get it um, through the censorship. And what I've been told is that it's actually a much, much better book when you read the whole thing as he actually uh, wrote it. And given everything that's happening in the world, it seems to me First Circle might not be a bad novel to read on a long plane trip, but we'll talk about that one later. All right. Well, I'll be looking forward to that review. I mean, I <clears throat> I will tease the fact to our audience that I had breakfast this morning with our mutual friend Barry Strauss, friend of the um, of the Shield of the Republic show, and uh, Barry told me that he is just finishing up a book on the Jewish wars in the ancient world. Very timely topic. It's uh, going to be published uh, this coming year, and so Barry will be back on Shield of the Republic to talk about that. But Today, we have a special guest, Jim Shudo, who is the chief national security correspondent of CNN. Um, he is uh, a graduate of Yale, one of my alma maters. Uh, so I'm glad, glad to have a, a fellow Eli on the show. Um, he is also um, the author of Shadow War, The Madman Theory, and uh, just out two weeks ago, The Return of Great Powers, Russia, China, and the Next World War. Uh, Jim is an extremely distinguished journalist, having won uh, not only an Emmy, but uh, the George Polk and Edward R. Murrow Awards. I guess, uh, Jim, is that the equivalent of an EGOT in the uh, news business? <laughs> I don't know if it's quite that level. Uh, it's, um, I mean, I I'm certainly honored. Uh, I'll await my EGOT. Uh, I'll await my EGOT someday. <laughs> Well, let's uh, let's dive into the book because it's uh, you raise a lot of fascinating things uh, in the book, which is extremely readable. Um, you know, in Shadow War and Madman Theory, you were talking really about conflict in the gray zone, whether that was in cyberspace or in uh, in areas like the South China Sea, where the borders are somewhat fuzzy uh, in terms of national sovereignty, and about uh, former President Trump's very disruptive influence on international affairs. In this book, you're talking really about the uh, prospect of really major war. And obviously, some of that has been um, prompted by the war in, in Ukraine. I wonder if you could start by telling us how the war in Ukraine uh, changed your perspective as a journalist looking at the international environment. Actually, could I, if I could, just could you begin by describing... Um... What, what it is that you do as a journalist, that is to say, I mean, you know, you're at CNN, obviously one of the really major outlets, and you're a very senior journalist there. Um, that's, I think, probably different from, you know, being a bureau chief here, bureau chief there, bureau chief somewhere else. So maybe if you could do that and then uh, go to Eric's, Eric's question as well. Because, I mean, one of the things that's striking about the book, it is a global perspective. You know, you're not just talking about Ukraine, you're talking about a whole bunch of places. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on. It's great to, it's great to be on with you, and I look forward to the conversation. Uh, so to, to what does it mean to be a journalist? Uh, you cover the news, right? Um, and th that can mean the news that happens before our eyes, a, a, a container ship hits a bridge, right? Or a, or a country invades another country, or a, 
um, presidential election. I mean, the, the list goes on, a school shooting, right? I mean, there's the news that happens before our eyes. Um, but then there's also, for someone like me, there's there's a beat, and I cover national security, so I'm, I am looking at topical issues under that umbrella every day, and that, that really spans... Uh, from from the Defense Department to the intelligence agencies to State Department uh, and, and to officials and contact contacts and events abroad as well. Um, so you have that beat aspect to it. And then what I try to do, and the reason I write books really, is that uh, I, I find, and part of this is for my own intellectual process, but also a, a sense of mission is to attempt to connect the dots for people to to explain what which, which events and how these events are related to each other and and for me for someone who has covered Russia and China uh, and the many ways and many places that that our country and our allies interact with Russia and China for many years uh, what led me to write the Shadow War first five years ago was was that I was noticing a pattern right of of seemingly unrelated conflicts or interactions um, or aggressive acts that actually were part of a, a, a matrix, really, a strategy that, interestingly enough, both Russia and China, two very different countries, were pursuing, which was to attempt to weaken the U.S. and challenge the U.S. and its allies and to weaken and challenge the, the rules-based international order we talk about, this, this system that the U.S. and its allies have helped construct over many decades uh, to, to generally keep the peace hasn't always worked, but to generally keep the peace. Um, so, you know, p p I consider part of my my mission or my value add is to not just cover the news, but to explain how it fits into a broader picture. And that's what I attempted to do with the Shadow War five years ago to say, listen, there's something going on here, right? You know, th these cyber attacks or these space weapons, uh, these land grabs at that point, uh, partial invasion of Ukraine or China's land grab in the South China Sea are part of a broader challenge to uh, the international system and to our interests, and we need to be aware of it. At that point, it was below, to your point, Eric, it was below the, the, the level of a shooting war, a kinetic conflict, and a shadow war. That's where I came up with that idea. It's just below the surface, gray zone activities. What struck me as I was sitting in Ukraine in February 2022, as the first Russian tanks were rolling across the border and the first cruise missiles were dropping on Ukrainian cities was, well, the war is out of the shadows. This is this is um, the largest war in Europe in 80 years. You have a, a country attempting to change the borders of Europe by force of arms, uh, and not just in a little way, not just slicing off a piece, say, in eastern Ukraine or trying to turn Transnistria away from Moldova, but to absorb a country of 40, 50 million people, right? The largest country in Europe by land size, landmass too. Uh, that's a big deal, right? And that is a, that's a clean break. It didn't come out of nowhere, right? There were signs in advance and, and there were smaller steps in advance, but that that uh, took the war out of the shadows and was a clean break, it struck me, with that period of relative peace and calm that we'd enjoyed post-1989, post-1991. Um, you know, history never ended. There, there was never the end of history, but we did have a respite. And it just struck me that that was the breaking point. And now it's out in the open. So long answer to, to two short questions, but I hope I got there. Let me, let me um, ask you about um, how some of your sources saw this. So uh, one of the things that, you know, struck me um, pretty forcefully in reading the book is um, at least in the European security side, when you're talking about that, uh, two of, of your on the record sources were uh, Miko Hautala, who is the Finnish ambassador to the United States. Uh, he's uh, an ex a hugely experienced diplomat. He was the Finnish ambassador to Russia, served in Ukraine as well, and also was uh, President uh, Sauli Ninisto's national security advisor, uh, but also the um, prime minister of Estonia, Kaya Kallas, who uh, is uh, has been a, a you know persistent presence on uh, you know international broadcasts about the war in Ukraine, and is now at least potentially a candidate for the NATO Secretary General job. Although I suspect it'll go to someone more in the Western European mold. Uh, but what did what was it about this sort of front line you know Finnish Estonian experience? The Estonians already being in NATO, Finland transitioning into NATO, that you found 
particularly compelling because it did seem to me that there was a uh, you know important message that they were transmitting. Yes. Well, deliberately for this book, I, I, I wanted to talk to and meet and travel to the broadest variety of places possible in Europe, East and West, uh, here in the U.S., uh, in Asia, spent time in uh, in Taiwan um, and and speak deliberately to people from different parties in each of those places to get the broadest view possible. Um, I certainly wanted to listen very closely to what the Eastern facing NATO allies, uh, current and new, uh, of course, Estonia has been in for a number of years and Finland just joining because they're closer to the Russia threat and they uh, they're certainly more aware and more concerned about Russia's aggression. And by the way, they've got a lot of personal experience of it. You know, they, they lived, you know, speak to Kaya Kalas, uh, you know, they lived under Soviet rule just a generation ago. So they're not speaking out of, um, they're not guessing, right? They, they, they have real life experience of this. And it's interesting, Kaya Kalas um, uh, you know, said to me, and this is in the book, she said, listen, for a lot of our Western facing NATO allies, this is an intellectual conversation, the discussion about the Russian threat. And she said, for us, it's existential that, you know, that, that uh, he denies our existence. Putin does much as he did uh, for Ukraine, denies it's uh, the Baltics right to independence. Um, so for us, it's not just something that he might do someday. Uh, we feel it's a very clear and present danger. So they have they have a more pointed view, right, of that threat. And I think it's important to to get that in. Now, I spoke to, to others that, that are further west, and, and it's not and it's not a clear-cut dividing line, right? Because when you speak, spoke to a lot of uh, UK officials, the UK has been very forward-leaning on this as well, and they're from the other side of the alliance. But, um, it, you, you know, and I spent time on a, on a NATO uh, task force in, in the Baltic Sea, which had half a dozen countries represented, you know, a German flagship, the Portuguese, the Spanish, etc. So I spoke to a variety of folks. And, and I think that in general, you know, the Finns and the, the, the Estonians, they have a lot of personal, very recent experience and proximity to the issue and and face-to-face -face dealings with, with the Putins of the world. So you really do want to listen to them. Um, and uh, they certainly have, they have a, a more immediate fear. But I do sense that a lot of the rest of Europe is moving in that direction, right? That, that folks who used to, to dismiss the threat uh, don't do so much anymore. But that's, that's um, one reason why I spent uh, a lot of time speaking to those folks in particular. You know, you, you describe in the book trying um, to make the case to your bosses at CNN uh, that, you know, th that this threat is really very serious. And you talk about encountering a fair amount of skepticism. Now, to be fair, you're also talk about encountering a lot of skepticism from people like Mark Milley, who was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, could you just talk a little bit about, you know, how did the, those kinds of consensus, that sort of consensus form in the journalistic world and how does it get broken? And, and is it any different from the way that consensus gets formed and gets broken, say, within government? Yeah. It's a good question. I think there are a lot of parallels, right? Uh, there are a lot of parallels to, to groupthink, right? That can take place in the news business as it does in, in well, the business world or, or in government. And I saw that uh, during my time in the State Department as well. So they're not, they're not entirely dissimilar. And, and there was a commonality to that prior to the Russian invasion. You had a lot of folks, my colleagues in the news business, uh, a lot of European leaders, right? Uh, Macron uh, among them. He was speaking to Putin days before the before the invasion, imagining that there was some deal that could be made. Zelensky, even you'll remember, was downplaying the threat, worried that the U.S. was was exaggerating the threat of the invasion to the detriment of the Ukraine's economy. So there, there were a lot of folks who had that skepticism, which was built on on a few things that struck me. One is, uh, you know, they had this impression. I think people invest Putin with far more wisdom than he actually has, right? You heard a lot of folks saying, he's too smart to invade Ukraine. He's playing three-dimensional chess. This is all part of a plan to fool us, and we don't want to be fooled by it. Well, lo and behold, actually, he was planning, and there he, <laughs> he rolled across the border. Um, so I think some of it is um, just a misinterpretation of, of his intentions and his willingness to, to, to break through all the norms and so on. And... and and that impression, despite a whole lot of evidence to the contrary, prior to February 2022, right? I mean, here's a guy who 
took a slice from Georgia in 2008, took two slices from Ukraine in 2014, uh, carried out the largest nation on nation cyber attack on Estonia in 2007, a NATO, a NATO member by then, you know, this idea that, well, he would never touch NATO. In fact, he has. I mean, not like a full scale invasion, but he has. Um, and folks just weren't connecting the dots, as it were. Um, and that that, you know, extended from the news business to folks in government, a lot of folks in this country as well. And and I think that's part of a larger phenomenon. I, I wrote about this in, in The Shadow War, too, that and, and I spoke, for instance, in Shadow War to the late Ashton Carter, who who copped to it because he said, I was part of, you know, I, I was among the, the officials who he used the, the term mirrored, who who looked at both Russia and China and imagined that, you know what, they want what we want in general. Um, even through years where there was a lot of evidence to the contrary, that that, that mirroring phenomenon continued. And, and I think it continued right up to, you know, for a lot of people, right up to February 2022. Now, there are still folks today, as you know, in this country who are like, oh, well, you know, it, whose fault was the war? And there's a candidate for president who says he could end the, the war in a day and he knows what Putin's wants and he could make a deal, et cetera, et cetera, which again denies the facts before our eyes, right? So some of that, some of that mirroring or denial still exists today, but uh, it was hard to break through. And, you know, you know, the U.S. was trying to show the world by declassifying a lot of intelligence it would not have been in, done in the past, you know, satellite images of the forces on the border, um, you know, intercepted communications of, of Russian commanders discussing invasion plans. So they were trying to push back against that. And for a lot of people, it wasn't convincing enough until the tanks started rolling in. So one question, just following up on that, um, you know, I, I, I was in uh, Munich at the Munich Security Conference like two days before the war broke out. And I'd been talking to a lot of European friends and acquaintances and it was clear to me that one of the things that was um, introducing a lot of skepticism on their part was the memory of Iraq uh, and weapons of mass destruction and so on. So again, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I know I'm going to be asking a lot of questions about about the world of journalism. Was that uh, was it a similar? Was there a similar kind of filter on the journalistic side? Do you think? I had conversations. I remember I had a phone call with some of my colleagues uh, who who brought up that very point. They said, well, remember Iraq WMD? And I said, okay, fair point, no question. But th this is not, th they have, they can see these forces building up, right? They got pictures of them. It was, you, you know, the, the, the when you looked at the balance of intelligence that went into this uh, invasion plans assessment compared to the, the WMD assessment, you know, what was the name? Curveball of that source. I mean, you know, it was it was not as fulsome an assessment, one might say. And and this one was more visible. It was tactile. Didn't didn't mean that, you know, Putin necessarily was going to, to make the call and order the troops in. But boy, he put the bulk of his conventional forces on, you know, on the border of Ukraine and his uh, including building the field hospitals and all the stuff you would need for an invasion. And his his generals were talking about the invasion. It was a pretty decently, you know, sourced assessment. Again, you know better than me, having had uh, security clearances as well, that assessments are assessments and they're incomplete information and, and the best judgment of that, uh, of that information, the best analysis of it. But this information was certainly more complete than the Iraq WMD one. And, and by the way, it turned out to be true. Now, what didn't turn out to be accurate, right, was how that war would progress. Because as you remember, the assessment was that uh, the Iran Ukrainians were going to get routed in, in a few days, but that didn't happen. They, they surprised on the upside. So it's it's not perfect, but they were at least right about the invasion. Yeah, a couple of points I would make on that. One is, um, you know, I actually wrote something around December of 21, in which I described what the administration was doing as an attempt at deterrence by disclosure that they were um, mm. doing something we did occasionally in the war on terror, which is publicize the information we had about a potential impending terrorist attack in the hope that you would take your adversary kind of out of their, you know, planning cycle and, and yeah. force them to go back and, and start over again. This was done in a much more systematic way and obviously not against a non-state actor, but, but a state actor. Um, and, I mean, to the point, your point, Jim, about Curveball. I mean, so Curveball, of course, was a German source that, uh, you know, we, the RIC used 
on the mobile um, uh, bio labs. It was uh, the idea that Saddam Hussein had mobile bio labs. One of the things that struck me about what the Biden administration was doing, it was much less collateral from other intelligence services involved here. This was much more U.S. intelligence being mm. disclosed. Yeah. So they didn't have to go through the process of getting allies to agree, you know, to, to disclose. They failed in the end, you know, to, um, to, to actually deter Putin. But they did, I think, I think it's fair to say they did set, um, set themselves up for success in the sense that they, um, uh, created a predisposition to disbelieve what uh, Putin and the Russians were saying about various false flag kinds of operations. And they, um, I think, laid the groundwork for the very, uh, something you described, which is a very close allied cooperation in supplying Ukraine uh, once the war, you know, actually uh, started. So, I mean, I, I give them, you know, a high points for that. You broke some news um, just as the book was coming out because you have a discussion um, of uh, events that took place in the fall of 22. You were just talking about the Russian failure to uh, seize Kiev and uh, decapitate the Ukrainian government and wrap this all up in 72 hours. By the fall, it was actually the Ukrainians who were taking territory back. And you describe in some detail um, something that uh, David Sanger, the New York Times, also wrote about uh, about the same time that your um, material appeared uh, on the CNN website just prior to the publication of the book, which was the fear that American officials had that in the fall of 22, in the uh, face of these battlefield setbacks, that the Russians were potentially preparing to use theater nuclear weapons. Um, and I'd like to dig into that a, a, a little bit. I mean, it, it's interesting that right around the time, I think just after, um, certainly before your book was published, uh, but after you had um, written it, there also was a leak of some Russian nuclear planning documents to the Financial Times that purported to show that the um, threshold for nuclear weapons use by Russia was lower somehow than it had been in the past. Although when you look at the documents, I mean, you look at the accounts of the documents in the Financial Times, and I think it was the Times of London as well may have gotten them. Um, it's hard to see how it actually differs from Russian doctrine as we know it, which has always uh, suggested that if the nature of the regime was in uh, threat as a result of either conventional or nuclear attacks, Russia reserved the right to use nuclear weapons. But in the, the episode you describe, and, and it's you, you have great detail in the in the book on this u.s officials um not only started to hear uh chatter about this among um russian officials they also got very alarmed about the russians talking about a potential ukrainian dirty bomb which would then be the cover the false flag cover for a russian use of of theater nuclear weapons and I, I want to just ask you about that. I mean, you acknowledge uh, that the sources you used, and presumably there some overlap between the sources you had and David Sanger did, because um, they tell roughly the same story, um, that although there was no movement visible of nuclear weapons, normally those of us who watch this stuff when I, we were in government would be looking for the 12th GUMO, the, the 12th uh, uh, general... Um, uh, office of the Ministry of Defense, which is responsible for nuclear weapons, to actually be moving them around on trains or trucks or whatever. There was no movement, but there was talk. Now, of course, because of the previous episode we were just discussing, the U.S. making public a lot of Russian planning, Russians knew we were monitoring what they were saying. So what, you know, there's a judgment being made here. Your sources were telling you that the judgment inside the administration was, this is very serious, they might be considering it. And you detail all the steps they took, getting China, India, others to weigh in with the Russians, weighing in through various channels directly, uh, sending Bill Burns, our former colleague, to speak with Sergei Naryshkin, the head of the SVR, the Russian Foreign Intelligence Service. 
But there's another potential story here, which is that President Biden had said very clearly at the outset of this that he wanted to support Ukraine, but uh, not at the point of having World War III. There had been a lot of discussion at the outset of the war of the potential for nuclear escalation. This is something that the Russians knew was a neuralgic point for the administration. So how do we know that this was genuine, not conversations held for the benefit of the listening big ear of, uh, uh, you know, of the intelligence community, and that it wasn't what the Russians call uh, reflexive control, which is the, I mean, really an idea as old as Shunza, trying to get your adversary to do what you want by making them think that you're going to do something that they, you know, therefore must take some action to preclude. How, how do we know this wasn't really an information op? So it's an assessment, right? And assessments are uh, built on a number of pieces and rarely are assessments 100% right. Uh, some are more correct than others. Like, I, what I reported um, uh, before the New York Times, I, I will note, uh, although, and David gave me credit for that, um, is that they had a number of pieces that led them to this assessment. And, and I'll walk through those pieces again. I mean, you touched on them. One, at the time, Ukraine was losing ground in the south. They had just lost Kherson, which was its biggest prize, the biggest city it had captured during the invasion. And they were losing further. The Russians did, yes. Uh, and the, the Russian forces, uh, thousands of Russian forces were in danger of being surrounded and cut off by Ukrainian forces. So there was uh, concern that that would have been such a catastrophic loss uh, that it was pushing Russia to consider the use of a tactical nuclear weapon. In addition to that, you had this public uh, campaign, if you want to call it that, by senior Russian officials, Sergei Shoigu and others, to, to claim that, well, actually, you, Ukraine is planning some sort of radiological attack, uh, perhaps a dirty bomb, perhaps an attack on Zaporizhia, etc., and the world has to be prepared for it. And Shoigu was calling up all of his colleagues around the world, um, that was another piece. The U.S. read of Russian military doctrine, which is, you know, as, as you know, not an, an exact science. I mean, there, there's some there, there are some foggy pieces in there, but their read was that Russia might uh, view the, the the loss of ground in the south and the potential loss of many thousands of forces as a potential threat to the entire operation. Uh, to territory which they claimed as Russian, even though it was Ukrainian territory, and therefore a threat to the state, and Putin is the state, so it might qualify uh, for their, you know, for a tactical nuclear attack under their their military doctrine. Again, it's not an exact science, but that was their read, their read of it, and then thrown into the mix intelligence intercepts of Russian commanders speaking about it, much as they had had intercepts of Russian commanders speaking about the invasion. Uh, several months before. So th they took all those pieces together and said, this is serious. Now, now, the other piece in terms of not having seen the movement of the weapons, these officials acknowledged to me they did not see that, but they said, we we aren't sure that we would see it in this case, because you would know if they were moving warheads onto an ICBM, but if it was a tactical nuke, which could be fired with conventional systems already in place in Ukraine, you might not see it. So that element of uncertainty led them to say, okay, we have to take this so seriously that we have to communicate this directly. Uh, for instance, Bill Burns to Narishkin, Milly to Gerasimov, you know, all along those lines are allies to Russia and then enlist um, unconventional allies in this case, uh, which was China and India to get on board and say, you got to warn Russia away from this. And and sources in the book give credit to, to Chinese and Indian efforts, some of which were public comments, statements uh, that uh, Xi Jinping made when I believe it was uh, the German chancellor was visiting him, statements before the UN by the Indian uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. They, they consider that uh, helpful. So anyway, that big picture, including the seriousness with which uh, Russia, China and India were taking the threat, led them to, if they didn't know 100%, they were certainly concerned about it. And that's, uh, that's where, it, where it came about. Could Russia have been playing games with us? I mean, we know that, that Putin rattles the nuclear saber frequently in his public, public comments, often to needle 
uh, that happens. There's no question. And by the way, for this book, I I spoke to uh, officials in Europe who who do believe in Kai Kalas being one of them that we allow ourselves to be snowed by the Russians on the nuclear threat because Russia knows, as you say, that we get really scared about that. So anytime they want to, you know, kind of uh, scare us away, they'll say, oh, by the way, we have nuclear weapons. We might use them, you know, so there, there is some of that. But um, and that's happened multiple times from Putin and Medvedev and others, but not with these other ingredients, you know, the potential loss of Russian forces, uh, forces on their back foot, the in intercepted communications, etc. So that in their view, it was different and, and more real. So, so as you probably uh, can tell, uh, Eric and I have dark, suspicious minds. And um, I mean, I, like Eric, I uh, frankly, I share the suspicion that the Russians were deliberately playing this up. And because at the end of the day, from their point of view, even if there is, uh, you know, the administration runs around and rallies people, uh, to, you know, tell them not to do it. That's not a bad situation for them to be in that, you know, people feel like we're just barely holding these people back from, uh, using nuclear weapons. I, I have to say, I also, obviously I haven't seen any of the classified intelligence in a very long time. The idea that people would move tactical nuclear weapons around with no special security measures, no special communications links. I find that very hard to believe. I don't think they, you move those around the way you move, 152 millimeter uh, artillery shells around. But I, 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 the even nastier and darker suspicions that I have have to do with what is, you know, intercepted communications uh, among Russian generals. That's pretty sensitive stuff. Um, signals intelligence, uh, which at one point you couldn't even talk about, uh, is still one of our most highly classified and one of our most valuable sources of intelligence. A and yet, uh, and, and sometimes governments very deliberately tell journalists about these things as they did at the, at the outset and, and for very good purpose in that case, you know, to try to see if they could deter Putin from invading by saying, we know what you're doing. So help me understand why all of a sudden U.S. government officials a few months ago, or however long ago it was, decide that it's okay to share with two of the country's most prominent national security journalists uh, the fact that we're listening in on Russian general officer telephone conversations. What, what do you, and, 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 and this is really about the craft of journalism. How much do you have to worry about that when you're reporting the story? Okay, well, let's see, a few questions. Listen, is there an information warfare aspect to this? Absolutely. And, and you know, U.S. officials have spoken quite openly about um, revealing and, and, and declassifying intelligence that they would not have done in the past, uh, in part to, to achieve ends. I mean, one, one way they did that was to, um, early in the early stages of the war, they exposed Russia's planned false flag operations uh, in Eastern Europe, they all had a whole host of plans uh, in in the works to, for instance, carry out "quote unquote" terror attacks in Eastern Ukraine, blame blame Ukrainian terrorists, Nazis, etc., requiring a you know Russian military action in the country. But the you know the U.S. got wind of them and said, "Hey, this is what the Russians are going to do," and and you defuse those false flag operations. So there's some there's some clever information warfare, in, you know, as w when when uh, intelligence gets uh, either. You know, shared with reporters or publicized in other ways. That there, there's no question. Um, there's no question that that happens. And listen, as a journalist, you have to be aware. We, you know, with with any source, under any circumstances, whether it's an intelligence story or a political story, you got to know your source, right? And you got to know whether your source has an axe to grind. Then you have to plug that into the broader picture, um, you know, so that you could just run it through your own credibility filters. For me, for instance, with the intelligence uh, that was. Uh, shared and declassified prior to the Russian invasion. I'd been covering this for some time, right? I'd been in Ukraine going back to 2014, and I'd I'd been writing about and reporting on and doing interviews about Russia's other uh, aggressive acts around Europe and around the world. So it it fit into that broader picture. It didn't come out of nowhere, right? So I found it personally credible based on the trend lines I'd been covering, you know, for some time. And that's part 
uh, the process as well. And again, not dissimilar from the way an intelligence analyst might look at it, right? They're going to look at the individual pieces and say, well, this fits in with the broader picture. And I certainly don't have access. You know, I, I did have a top secret security clearance when I was in government, but I don't have it anymore. So, so I have to, you know, I have to, you know, use less of that information to try to, to build a story that I find credible. I will say, listen, that, that a lot of the questions you're asking about this nuclear scare are, are, and the doubts you're expressing are, aren't entirely dissimilar than the doubts many expressed prior to Russia's invasion, right? They're like, well, you know, and that was exactly the read that many people had. They're like, well, Putin is doing this just to scare Europe, right? You know, he's he's playing three-dimensional chess, He's not really going to invade. Trump said that many times, but of course he did. And I'm not saying they're equivalent. I'm just saying that, you know, sometimes, you know, listen to what they say, right? They, they end up uh, following through on it. And it's, and it's not the first time that, that uh, intelligence agencies have done this. I look back to the 2016 election and Russian interference in the 2016 election. When you look at that intel report in January 2017 that, that uh, described Russian interference and what its intent was, um, it was based in part on not just intel intercepts, but intelligence, it seems, gleaned from the highest source the U.S. has ever had, the Kremlin, right? And it may have been part of the reason that that, and by the way, that was a story I reported first, the extraction of that that uh, that uh, Russian spy, it may have been part of the reason that that Russian uh, spy was taken out of the country, right? So there had been other times when they were like, listen, and, and you know, you, you do that with some awareness of the cost, right? That you might very well lose such a source like that or expose a source and so on. That's all part of the uh, the judgment they have to make. And, and listen, um, the uh, all of us have to be aware of how this kind of stuff is weaponized, even by our side. So we have to go into, we have to enter this with, with some skepticism and not believe everything you say or hear and try to, you know, run it through whatever credibility filter you have. And it's tough. It's not easy, right? You know, you don't, you, you don't always get it right. You just try to do it as best you can. Yeah. I, just if I could follow up on that, because no, I, I agree with you. And I think, you know, I think sometimes people figure, uh, think that uh, top notch journalists are easily spun. And I don't think that's, that's really true. Mm -hmm. um, the, the follow on I wanted to ask you though, as you just mentioned, you did have a couple of years in government serving in uh, the embassy in Beijing. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of journalists don't have that experience. Um, did it affect how you do your job as a journalist? Does it affect how you yeah. report stories and how you understand, simply how you understand what's going on in the world? Yeah, it absolutely. I learned so much, I got to say, and, and it's, um, I feel lucky for it, right? You know, I got to, Serve, and it's the reason I took the job to be in the middle of this relationship between the U.S. and China at a consequential time, and to uh, not just have a security clearance where you can read the reports and, and the analysis, but also be in the room for meetings with senior Chinese officials. And things happened while I was there. If you remember, while I was there, the um, the blind dissident, as he was known, Chen Guangchen. Uh, took refuge in the U.S. embassy. That was a major international issue between the U.S. and China. Um, so I got to witness those things, provide the best advice I could in those circumstances and be involved. Um, so that was just, I learned a lot, right, just straight up. But I also learned, you know, that uh, something I knew to some degree, but you, there's no substitute for being in the middle of it, that, listen, you know, I think from the outside, we can have this impression that the government knows everything, right? I mean, you, you have the largest intelligence apparatus in the world. They have all these sources. They know what's, they can, you know, take a picture of anybody from space a million miles, you know, all that kind of stuff. We kind of like, they know everything in intercept. The truth is they know a lot, right? But again, they're imperfect people working with imperfect information, often making the best judgments they can. They have enormous tools that, that I don't have, but but uh, they get stuff wrong and they get stuff right. And some are high confidence assessments. Some are low confidence assessments. There are people with axes to grind inside and outside of the government. Uh, you know, so you learn that as well. And that's, um, you know, that, that's important to know because uh, and to see play out because it just helps you, I think, um, you know, get it helps you, for instance, when you're presented with a story like intelligence on the Russian invasion, it helps you run it through your kind of credibility filter. And the, the final thing I'll say is this, is that, it also gives you, listen, government is flawed. We've all, you, we've all worked in government. Um, but by and large, 
they're generally good people trying to do their best, you know, with the country's best interests at heart. There are exceptions to that, but in general, you know, these aren't bad people, right? And and particularly today, when everybody's lost confidence in every institution, um, I think that that's an important message to get out. We've got a lot of good people doing their best, making enormous sacrifices, working in difficult countries under threat, away from their families, and you know, trying to do their best. I think that's important for us to know too, because the nature of my job is adversarial, right? With the and that's the way it should be, right? Because you don't want to be you don't want to be their best friend, right? You want to have some distance, but doesn't mean you have to distrust them or think that they're horrible people right? <laughs> or think they're out to get you because that could also be insidious in its own way. Right. Yeah. That's a really important point, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I think we, <clears throat> I think both Elliot and I agree with that. We, we try to, I mean, we've got plenty of criticisms of the current administration, but we try to r remember our own times in government and what it felt like uh, when you're in there sort of beleaguered yeah. and, you know, uh, I, I have discovered, though, that once you leave government, you immediately add 25 IQ points and you're so much smarter right. than, <laughs> than the people who are still behind <laughs> government. And, and, and I've also noticed that when you testify before the Congress, when you're an outside expert witness, you get treated with so much more deference and kindness than you do when you're an administration witness of, of whatever administration. <laughs> I try to keep all that in mind. You know, we you, you talked about your time in China with Ambassador Locke, uh, Jim, mm. and you talk in the book about um, your discussions uh, in Taiwan uh, about the you know uh, cross straits flashpoint that we all know is is out there, and a lot of your discussion focuses on uh, Taiwan's lessons from Ukraine and and what they're learning mm. and how they have concluded that. Uh, you know, they, they are going to have to fight if they have to fight, uh, you know, an asymmetric uh, conflict and that they have to, as you describe in the book, make themselves into a very undigestible meal for, for the PRC, a porcupine. Mm -hmm. as it were. Um, but my sense of this, because um, people have been talking about this now for kind of almost a, a decade about trying to... Um, you know, create dilemmas and problems for a, a Chinese amphibious invasion, which would be a very mm -hmm. difficult, um, you know, military undertaking across 90 miles of, you know, of uh, open ocean. Um, the, the very hard thing to accomplish. Uh, certainly the Chinese military has never done anything on that scale or like that. Um, but my sense is that Taiwan is not very far along and nor are we in helping them become a porcupine. I mean, it's, it's been a lot of discussion, but we haven't really quite gotten there. Is that your sense as well? Or do you think more progress has been made than I'm allowing? I think they're definitely making progress. Uh, I spoke to Admiral Li Ximin, you, you may have met, who was their, I suppose, sort of their equivalent to chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, and he comes from the Navy side. And, and he's one of the folks who's been pushing for this transition for some time, pushing Taiwan to to adjust its way away from sort of, you know, um, uh, legacy weapon systems or, you know, big ships, power projection and and more on asymmetric uh, defensive weapons, you know, and training their units to be more mobile and and that kind of thing. And, and he, he speaks quite openly in the book that that took, you know, he had, he had to fight right to get that to get that view across. And there certainly are still skeptics, but it does seem like it's it is changing. And some of that pressure is coming from the states and the kinds of weapons that we sell them, right? You know, different than you did in the past. Um, and I, I went and I spent time with both the Navy, the Air Force, and the uh, Army units who were training for, uh, to defend the island. And, um, and they, you know, they take this very seriously. They, they watch for lessons from Ukraine. Uh, they certainly speak the language of asymmetric warfare. And if they don't quite say porcupine, but they, you know, in that kind of, um, in that uh, kind of general view. So, um, you know, the, the challenges are still enormous, right? Even if you snapped your fingers and they had that kind of force tomorrow, you know, this is still China, right? We're talking about, which is, ginormous and Taiwan is small. And um, though it's surrounded by water, China has weapons systems that could really devastate that place in a short period of time, right? Now, at tremendous cost to China's own forces, because Taiwan also has tremendous capabilities. And 
this president at least has committed the U.S. to some sort of military intervention to defend Taiwan. And that, when you look at the war games, are just devastating for everybody. So um doesn't make the picture any easier. But I, I like the way the way Millie described it is, is, you know, the U.S. strategy is effectively not today that, you know, they, they hope to inject enough doubt into Xi Jinping's calculation that he wakes up in the morning and looks at the picture and says, not today. And then the next day, you hope he does the same thing. Yeah, it's, you know, it's an interesting thing. This is a it's a larger issue in a way that, that that's how we think about it. I mean, we used to think if we're going to if we could end up in a war. And if it's a war, you want to make sure that you can win. And I think even within government, uh, to a remarkable degree, that's not how we frame things. It's even, you know, it's interesting that Milley, a, a general, would frame it that way, that we just want to, you know, we're designing forces to inject doubt, which is quite different from saying we're we're developing forces that can really prevail. But, you know, um, the, what, one thing that strikes me about the book is it, it doesn't really talk about the Israel-Gaza war. Uh, of course, it was already in production. Is that, do you view that war as just kind of orthogonal to the central issues that you're talking about with Russia and China? Or if you had more time and you'd written the book, you know, maybe a year from now, do you think you would have, would you have tried to weave that in in some way as well? How, how do you, how does that fit into your conceptual framework? Sure. Well, fair question. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I was, I was in Israel late October, early November, following the October 7th attacks. I'd already uh, just about handed the, the manuscript in. Um, and I called my editor and I was like, we got to talk about this. And I, and I added, listen, I, I was not going to be able to, to add another, you know, 100 pages to the book on it, just based on time. And of course, the events were still happening. So it wasn't quite clear how things were going to play out. But I, but it was clear. And I spoke to senior Israeli officials and, and U.S. officials as well, that Russia was doing what it often does, which is part of the broader picture, which was just stoking the flames where it could, right? It liked to see uh, the U.S. mired in something in the Middle East and America's ally, although, of course, Russia has a deep relationship uh, with Israel as well, but America's ally in trouble, that just occupies us in a way that they see as advantageous to them. And I thought it was notable, and I note this in the book, that Russia sent an S-300 system to Hezbollah in the midst of this via the Wagner Group, but certainly with the Kremlin's okay, which is would be a nice way to make it more difficult for Israel if it were to have a northern front, maybe protract that end of the war, which is kind of a classic Russian thing to do, which is just disrupt. You know, as Bill Burns tells me in the book, he's like, you know, Russia's view of the international order that, you know, Putin's the kind of guy, in his words, who will bring the temple down. You know, they just, they, they, they like to disrupt, and you saw some of that. Now, yes, to your point, had I written the book later, there would be a, a longer section on that, but I do think you you at least get that sense of how they operate. Now, it is interesting, I have spoken to, to, to uh, sources and officials in the region who have made the point that, to some degree, Russia is sort of odd man out in this conflict, right, that it has less influence than it, than it imagines, um, on this one, but uh, it doesn't take a lot to disrupt, and Russia's pretty good at disrupting because they don't they don't uh, mind they don't mind the chaos, you know. <laughs> and that's been their traditional policy in the region for a long time, which is to yeah. just, you know, keep the pot boiling and you keep the United States you know, preoccupied and yeah, um, its attention focused on that. You mentioned when we were talking about Taiwan, uh, you know, President Biden's statements that uh, he would, uh, you know, unequivocally defend Taiwan, mm -hmm. including uh, at least on a couple of occasions to your CNN colleague, Anderson Cooper. Um, it it was quite striking to me that recently um, you know, presidential candidate Donald Trump said, absolutely, I wouldn't defend Taiwan. And, you know, China is big. Taiwan mm -hmm. is small. You know what? You know. They compete with us, you know. Um, you know why would we? Why would we defend them? Which may may have come as a shock mm. to some people who think that the Trump presidency was a big, you know, um, uh, a big effort to reorient us towards the pacing challenge of China, as his national security yeah. strategy and national defense strategy suggested, at least in formal documents. Um, you have a whole chapter in the book uh, yeah. about. Uh, Trump. Um, that is, I think, 
uh, perhaps in, in a book that has a lot of things in it that are sort of scary and terrifying is perhaps the most terrifying thing of all, uh, because you rely very heavily on um, on the record comments from mm -hmm. people who worked very closely with Donald Trump, you know, on national security matters day to day for mm -hmm. extended periods of time. I mean, have in mind uh, John Kelly, former chief of staff, former yeah. secretary of Homeland Security. And John Bolton, former National Security Advisor. I've had similar conversations, by the way, with both of them. Um, and, and both of them, you know, as you uh, recount in the book, uh, basically say he is not fit uh, to serve as President of the United States and that a second term would bring almost incalculable risks to the nation's security and to the rules-based uh, global order that you've talked about earlier. Mm. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, how, you know, you've already written, mm. a, you know, kind of a, a book about the, the madman theory about, you know, Trump's you know, disruptive effects. Mm. Um, and you talked, all, you know, to other people who were less anti-Trump, but also um, had reservations. I'm thinking my friend Matt Pottinger, for instance, former deputy national security mm -hmm. advisor. But how did you think about that chapter? I mean, typically, that's not the kind of chapter you see in a book like this. Mm -hmm. Well, here's the thing. It, it just struck me that you couldn't write a book about the return of great power competition without describing the two, frankly, diametrically opposed approaches that you have, that, that this country is going to make a decision about, you know, in, in the November election. They, whatever your politics, uh, the Trump versus Biden view of the world is is vastly, vastly different. And the U.S. place in the world uh, and and how to adjust to this this new era of great power competition. And it's not like a incremental difference, you know, 10 degrees this way, 10 degrees that way. It's really 180. And as you say, John Kelly and Bolton and others say, you know, if, if Trump will be reelected, Ukraine aid ends and that, you know, Trump has said that himself, so you don't have to guess about it. Uh, the U.S. will not defend Taiwan. I mean, it, there's a story I tell in the book. Bolton said Trump used to sit in the Oval Office, uh, point at his Sharpie and say, see the tip of that pen? That's Taiwan. See this desk? That's China. To, to make the point that Taiwan has no chance against China, and therefore we have no business defending it. So they say in quite explicit terms, if I'm Ukraine, I'd be worried. If I'm Taiwan, I'd be worried. They make the point that just as he has no real interest in NATO and doesn't see it in, in America's interest. And they say that he very likely will attempt to get the U.S. out of NATO. And if, if not, due to legislation and Congress won't ratify, he'll effectively neuter it by, as commander in chief, rendering Article 5 meaningless because, and again, this is something he said <laughs> out loud. I'm not, Russia, do whatever the hell you want, right? Uh, and they tell the story in there about how he very nearly pulled the U.S. out of NATO in 2018. But they say similar, he has a similar view of U.S. defense alliances with South Korea and with Japan. Um, so that's a retreating America, uh, huge consequences for our allies and for parts of the world that that uh, that we as Americans are used to going to safely, et cetera, and doing business in. Um, that's a big choice. And he also imagines that out of pure force of will and personality, he can make deals with Xi and Putin to sort of, you know, he's willing to, to, to accommodate and find peace, which to me strikes me as not fact-based because these are strategic decisions by Russia and China to undermine the U.S., weaken the U.S., and break down the system. You know, the, the best negotiator in the world cannot change those countries' strategic interests. So um, that's a big choice. And, the, and again, you know, like, like you say, don't believe me. Believe the guys who worked with him very closely in the last administration because they say this very much on the record. I just as I was writing the book, it's, it's not a political book. It's about the world. But America's place in the world is consequential. And we have an election coming that will decide, you know, it, a quite dramatic difference in approaches to that. You know, I, in a, uh, a book that has a lot of powerful parts, I, I have to say, I thought that was, that was the most powerful and it's disturbing. Uh, we're, we're running uh, to the end of our time here. I, I had one last question I wanted to ask you. You've got this vast beat, national security, I mean, it, it literally global. 
Uh, you must have some stories that you think, gosh, I really wish I could devote more time to this. I think it's really important, but I'm just spread too thin. Could you just tell us what one or two of those stories might be? If you're saying if I were to go to the place and tell them or, or squeeze well, it into the book? It, you mean? It, it, well, either either one. So stories that you think need, yeah. you would really like to see being yeah. told to the American people or to a global yes. audience, and CNN is global, that, um, you know, just don't get told enough. I think, sure. Um, I think this is one of them. I think that when we talk about the election, we talk about it in a lot of ways, we don't talk enough about what a consequential decision this will be for America's place in the world. I think that's quite important. But I also think we don't do nearly enough coverage of how the great powers interact in the global South, because there is a great game underway on the continents of Africa and, and Latin America today, uh, China with the Belt and Road, Russia with various coups, and, and you name it, uh, to establish influence in there, there and often successfully, it's not perfect. And, and I also think that, you know, this is just from perspective, we don't want to approach either Russia or China as 10 feet tall, because they have their own weaknesses. Russia's economy is decrepit. They just lost their entire European market for, for uh, their for energy. Um, they've got an aging population. China's economic growth is flattening and it's, it's hitting this demographic wall, etc. So we don't ever want to give the impression that they're perfect. And when I look at Belt and Road, that's one example. I mean, Belt and Road kind of ticks a lot of people off, right? Because China comes in. I mean, think of Sri Lanka and they build this port and they're like, oh, you're in debt. Actually, I want that port for 99 years. Sounds a lot like Hong Kong, by the way, uh, which China is still burning about, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the treaty there. So um, I think... Uh, Global South, we have to spend a lot more time looking at how this is happening there, where the U.S. is behind and where it needs to interact more similarly in Latin America. And then I think the Arctic, too. And I talk about the Arctic a little bit in this book, and I've done some stories up there, but that is another great game where you have certainly the U.S. and Russia head to head there, but also China as a player in that space, as the ice melts, it's, it's both a business story, but it's also a national security story. And one of my favorite trips ever uh, was to go on a, a U.S. sub during the Ice X exercises up there and bust through the ice and walk out and kind of, you know, see the see the forever sunlight, uh, but also be part of those exercises, which are, you know, part of this cat and mouse game, keeping your eyes on Russian subs as they as we're testing each other out. I think um, those fields of play, they may seem far away, but uh, they're really active right now. Yeah. Yeah, you you touch on the on the space issues um, in the mm. book, and and you know one thing I know I'm concerned about, and there's been a lot of attention, obviously, thanks to um, uh, Chairman Turner of the House Senate or House uh, mm -hmm. Intelligence Committee about whether the Russians are or aren't going to put a nuclear weapon in space, <clears throat> but um, you know China has become you know the major spacefaring country over the last couple of years, which is a story we haven't paid much attention to, and building a lot of ground stations in in um, in Latin America. Yes. And, uh, yep. Very very worrisome because I, I can't recall now whether you talk about it or not, but the uh, the launch several years ago by China of a fractional orbital bombardment system, which approached the United States yeah. from the south rather than the north. Um, which we lack, or we're changing it, but we at the time lacked the ability to track. Uh, very, very worrisome for what it says about potential China, Chinese intentions as they become a nuclear yeah. peer, which is something you do talk about um, yeah. in the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely talk about space. I talked about this in, in uh, The Shadow War, and I, and I talk about it in this book too. That's another example. When I, when I try to explain this to audiences that that we, we may like to think that this is a distant problem and, you know, the, the Ukraine war, Taiwan's far away. It's not really our fight. But, you know, the, first of all, I, I believe from a values perspective, it is our fight. And also that as these systems break down, that does not serve our selfish interests, too. It's not just for uh, the sake of uh, the sovereignty of the Ukrainian people or the Taiwanese people. It's also because we benefit from from this system. But I also say that you know, the weapon systems that both China and Russia have and deploy are designed to bring pain to us at home, right? To, to turn the lights out in Washington via cyber attack or to take away GPS capabilities, which would, wouldn't just mean you're driving your car into the water, right? It means, you know, 
all the way financial transactions get timestamps and train signals and so on. Anyway, the weapons are designed to make it so we feel it too in the event of a conflict. Our guest has been Jim Shudo. His new book is The Return of Great Powers, Russia, China, and the Next World War. And Jim, since, uh, you know, writing seems to be a kind of uh, passion and habit of yours, I expect that in a couple of years' time, there'll be another book, and I hope we'll be able to bring you back as a guest on Shield of the Republic. I'd love it. It's a real honor to speak to both of you. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Jim.